So good afternoon, everybody, um, and a welcome to all of you. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Paul Lane. Um, I'm the professor of the deep history and archaeology of Africa here at uh, Cambridge University. Um, it's a delight to welcome you all, both uh, colleagues and students from within the department, but others from across the university and from elsewhere to this very first uh, seminar in the department's Garrett seminar for the new academic year. As you all know, we are facing relatively challenging times and I'm sure all of us would much rather be sitting in a room together um, and being able then to uh, enjoy each other's company over a, a glass of something after uh, the seminar. Um, the one takeaway advantage, if you like, of the fact that we're having to do our run our seminars remotely is, of course, um, we have uh, the opportunity, and I'm glad so many of you have taken it, to, to have participants who are physically um, away from Cambridge being able to, to join and uh, listen to the seminar and participate. So just a few rules um, and reminders to you all before we kick off. Um, please uh, keep your microphones muted for the time being. Um, we will be recording both the seminar and the Q&A discussion. If you don't want your face to appear uh, on that recording, then uh, but you do have a, a question that you want to, to ask to the speaker uh, at the end, um, then you're kindly asked to um, turn off your camera so that, that uh, you're not recorded in that way. But we hope you'll all be very happy with that and we will be posting the recording of this seminar and the Q&A Q on the Department of Archaeology's YouTube channel after the event. Uh, if you do have questions uh, for the speaker, I think the best way at least to uh, get things going, um, and particularly because there are quite a large number of you, so we might miss people who are putting their hands up, is if you can um, send your uh, questions to uh, Laurie Bonner and or myself um, as the meeting hosts, um, this hopefully won't go to anybody else, and particularly won't end up uh, on the speaker's screen whilst he's talking and distracting him. Um, but we will run through those as we uh, um, enter into the Q&A session. I should just also say that uh, the first three of our Garrod seminars uh, this year are all falling, falling those falling in uh, the month of October. We're also hoping that they, well, we have planned them so that they mark uh, Black History Month here in the UK. We have an exciting speaking speaker um, next, next week, next two, uh, Thursday, same time, same place. And then on the last Thursday of October, we will be having a a round table panel discussion and I'll draw your attention, give you a bit more details at the end of this. And they're also available on our website. So I think without taking up much more time, uh, I'm going to begin by saying it is such a great pleasure to welcome um, Dr. Abidemi Babatunda Babalola, who is a Smuts Research Fellow here in the Center of African Studies Cambridge, but he's also a frequent visitor and the, um, also a, a research fellow at the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research in the department. Uh, he's uh, been contributing very significantly to some of our teaching, uh, and it's a real delight to have him today to kick off the seminar series for the, for the year on a really exciting and quite provocative topic. Um, Africa and the Discourse of Inventiveness, Deep Historical and Archaeological Perspectives. So I'm going to hand you over 
uh, hand it over now to you, Tunde, to present, and we look forward to the Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Foley, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for the invitation to present at the uh, Gerald uh, Lecture for uh, the year and for the semester. I so much appreciate the opportunity. And uh, thank you all for joining from wherever you are joining from. We appreciate that you are able to join us today. Um, today, I will be talking on, um, like uh, Paul said, topic that is say, a little bit provocative and then uh, but I will try to do, I mean, not, I'm not trying to do actually justice to the topic, but to present um, what we can learn from, you know, applying archaeology and the material, you know, intervention into understanding the inventiveness, I mean, the discourse of inventiveness uh, of African and uh, African. So I should say that um, when I say Africa in this talk, I mean Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, that is where most of my uh, example will be drawn from. And then I, so for this course, are we, I mean, for this talk, let's see, uh, I'm trying to go to the next slide. It seems not, okay. Yeah, so I will be talking uh, briefly. I mean, the first half of my talk we uh, focus on the, uh, I mean, looking at the views of early Europeans in Africa and the, how the idea of uh, non inventive Africa really started in terms of how um, early Europeans described uh, Africans, particularly Black Africans. And then I will spend the uh, second half of the lecture talking about my research on the glass production in Ileife. And then I will briefly uh, mention uh, other biotechnologies that have uh, shown um, evidence of uh, invention in Africa. Then I will conclude. So if uh, I think I, I will start by showing a question that uh, Professor Shirukuri, Shadrach Shirukuri threw in uh, one of his talk, you know, talking to the audience and he asked them if anybody, you know, like now everybody has a different gadget, you know, a cell phone, iPad and stuff like that. And he asked the question like, how many of the gadgets you are currently holding or using are made in Africa? I mean, for, Obviously, I know that question will be, you know, none. And uh, this idea that uh, most of uh, the technologies that we use or tag gadgets that we use today are not really made in Africa kind of make a lot of people kind of disconnect with what Africa really has to offer or what Africa has really achieved in the time past. And uh, at the end of this talk, I think I'll be able to point on a uh, you know, few things that African have actually invented in my own, uh, in my own view, you know, that's how I'll, I would describe those uh, inventions. Then let me start by looking briefly into the notion of uh, the early Europeans in Africa about Africa, what they saw, what they met, and they, how they actually described, you know, what they see, I mean, what they saw. So to the best of my knowledge, I think the early Europeans in Africa, the early uh, 15th, late 15th centuries up to 15th century, they were fairly uh, honest, at least in their description of what they saw. So uh, one of, I mean, I think they were fairly honest and that they described what they saw on the ground as exactly how they saw it. So some of uh, the early Europeans in Africa, for example, uh, Pacheco Pereira described, um, described uh, the Ijebu, Ijebu, the you know, uh, kingdom at that time as a very big city. So that was the kind of impression he had when he first uh, had a glance of Ijebu, the city in, in today's southwestern part of Nigeria. 
and the, the uh, English merchant uh, Thomas name also described uh, a town in, to, in modern Ghana today as a big in circles as London. There might be a little bit of exaggeration in that anyway, but at least in terms of the size, you know, they are describing what they saw, which I think uh, their description could also be taken to mean something that was really impressive and uh, not as uh, barbaric as, you know, I mean, as we later came to realize by the uh, 19, I mean, yeah, 18, 19th century Europeans. Then um, account of the uh, of Vasco da Gama also uh, shows that he described uh, one of the Swahili cities as, uh, you know, uh, very large and uh, it's of good buildings of stones and mortars with terraces, which is very impressive. He went on to describe the wall, the towers, and the, the proximity to shore, the trees, the gardens, fruits, and animals, which I think uh, you will agree with me that all these are obviously not an impression of a kind of a deranged society that he first uh, met in, in, in the coast of uh, East Africa. So this is the kind of account of uh, Africans that were recorded in early, you know, in the 16th and late 15th and early 16th century up to the, uh, the end of 16th century. But by by uh, 18, 19th century, the narrative kind of changed to something completely different. And then one of the reasons that actually uh, account for that change in narrative was that uh, the European achievement in science and technology in the 18th century, you know, became the yardstick for measuring advancements, you know, technology and development. And in the light of that, uh, in the light of in the light of that, uh, the narrative about African and uh, especially uh, dark skinned people changed, you know, drastically from what we saw in the 16th century to something that is more kind of a derogatory. Uh, David Ohm was a, a a Scottish philosopher of the 18th century, and then uh, known for his uh, philosophical empiricism, you know, skepticism and uh, naturalism. He described Africans, you know, in his work as I'm apt to suspect the Negroes to be naturally inferior to the white. There scarcely ever was a civilized notion of the complexion, nor even any individual eminent in action or speculation, nor no ingenious manufacturers among them on heart, no sign. So he described, you know, black as inferior to black, I mean, to white, and he looks at, you know, he compares the level of a scientific development in Europe with what was uh, in Africa at that time. And then he came to this conclusion that, of, of course, there's no way you can compare uh, blacks or Africans with whites at that time. And then we also have a account of uh, Edward Long, a Jamaican born uh, British, and his father and himself were slave owners. And uh, he wrote in his book, uh, History of Jamaica, that uh, Black failed to demonstrate any appreciation of heart or inventive ability. You know, so we see how the narrative changed from you know, big city, beautiful city, well-organized society to this very a uh, derogatory you know, description in the 18th century. And then uh, we are, you know, most of us are familiar with uh, the Oxford professor who talks about uh, Africa as not having any history. That shows that the idea of, uh, you know, uh, dark Africa, you know, where there is no history, you know, the only thing you see there is darkness continues the, to early 20th century which also find its way into uh, the academic discourse as we can see from the work of uh, Professor uh, Rupa in uh, 1967. So, but by uh, 
mid and towards late 20th century, the narrative again now kind of begin to change. By that time, we already have you know a lot of uh, Africans who were you know African uh, intellectuals you know who were kind of standing to contest the narrative about dark Africa, dark continent, you know, and stuff like that. Of course, I mean, many people will not agree with uh, Sheikh Anta Adiop's work, especially how he describes, uh, you know, what civilization, uh, yeah, what civilization has been an African invention, I mean, black invention. Many will not agree, I mean, with his work, and today his work is considered to be very pro problematic and which lack a lot of, I mean, lacks uh, scientific evidence. I, I agree with that. However, that is one thing that his work actually achieved at that time was, you know, he presented this kind of a very provocative idea and also allowed other African intellectual at that time to follow through. And then a lot of people then, you know, in the uh, 60s, 70s now took interest in looking at the origin of African technology and science. So I think uh, he, he did, you know, a, a pretty good job in that in that respect. And today, of course, some of his uh, devotees still very much believe in his work. And I think uh, he achieved something really important in changing the narrative. So uh, we also have uh, the work of uh, Gloria Thomas uh, Emigweli, who uh, did a uh, quite impressive work on the science and technology in Africa. She looks at, she argues that um, African philosophy must be, you know, invoked into the discourse of uh, science and technology in Africa for us to really understand Africans' contribution to uh, global science and technology. And then more recently, the work of uh, Klapati Mavunga is very, very important and very, very interesting for me which uh, talks about, you know, um, what do science and technology, science, technology and innovation mean from Africa? To me, a couple of things, you know, stand out in his work. Number one, uh, he argues that Africa needs to, I mean, needs its own histories and philosophies of technology. And this requires deep immersion in African idioms and long history, which I think, uh, I, I, think I, I agree with him that for us to understand the history of science and technology, we have to immerse, our, immerse ourselves in understanding African history, philosophy, you know, and the, the idioms, which I think is very important. We also talk about a transcend workspace, which means that, you know, when we look at a, a, a technological space, it's not something that is usually fixed in a particular location that is kind of shifted at times. You know, he, in his own case, he looks at uh, the, um, uh, it looks at the community in the uh, Zimbabwe and how this idea of uh, uh, hunting and the gathering kind of shifts, you know, uh, over several space. Then he also talks about uh, indigenous space from which to make critical intervention into the question of scientific uh, and the technological and the uh, and the innovation. That how do we invoke in an indigenous space in understanding this question. And then more importantly, which uh, last thing I will draw on on his work, it talks about the idea of uh, you know, imitation being seen as something inferior, you know, that that idea of uh, considering something that is imitated as inferior actually emanated sometimes in the 18th, 19th century which he argues that uh, at times, you know, in, um, imitation is also a form of invention, which I pretty much agree because, I mean, if you look at it even in modern times, when you, in modern times, when you see something like, uh, let's say a couple of years or months or, you know, weeks ago, and you remember that and you try to recreate that thing, it, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of, you know, ingenuity in trying to recreate that thing which you have seen. So the argument is even if we consider some of the uh, technological advancement in early African community as being, you know, a product of uh, imitation, but we also need to look at the process of imitation itself as, you know, as a form of invention, which I think I really agree with him on that. And I also uh, I share that point. 
So now I quickly turn on uh, looking at archaeology of glass in Africa. So what do we know and then what can we really, you know, uh, get from looking at archaeology of glass in uh, Africa? So before I go on, let me quickly just uh, uh, talk very briefly about archaeology of glass in Africa. Uh, mostly uh, glass, the uh, earliest evidence of glass being in, uh, glass in Africa is dated to between 7th and the 5th century BC, which came from a site in Mali and then in the form of a very fragmented uh, glass bead. And at that time, there were very few archaeological evidence of uh, glass in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, not until around, uh, you know, uh, 9th century, uh, nine, eight, ninth century AD that we started seeing a lot of glass beads and the glass fragments from archaeological sites in the in Sub-Saharan Africa. And what that tells us is the, you know, is the uh, uh, the fact that, you know, what that tells us actually is the question of origin and source of this glass. So if we don't see glass in the very early archaeological context and we start to see glass bead in eight in ninth and the eighth century AD. So what was the source of those glass beads? That actually took a lot of uh, literature on glass in West Africa. And also the argument at the time was that there was one, there was no primary glass production in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that two, most glass beads or glass objects you see, if not all, actually came from outside the uh, the subcontinent and then looking at the origin of glass then people focus on you know the external origin to understand where the glass uh, came from and the work of uh, claire davidson you know in 1972 is the you know pioneer work on understanding chemical composition of uh, glass in the in Africa, she did you know an incredible work. I mean, considering the time she was doing the work, she worked on the a lot of archaeological uh, glass from archaeological sites across Africa, from Ibuku in the southeast Nigeria, from Ife, which I'll be talking about uh, where I'm working on in the southwest Nigeria, from Map Mapukungwe in the uh, Zimbabwe and other sites. So she basically came up with um, two compositional, three compositional groups. Group one, which he believed that might have originated from a, from the Islamic world, and then group two, which she believed must have originated from the medieval Europe, and group three, which she classified as Mexenelians, uh, you know, like kind of combination of everything. So she was very particular about Ileife for several reasons because. There has been uh, an idea about the uh, 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 local production of glass bead in Ilife at that time. And uh, she was very specific in a conclusion that there is no evidence that any of the glasses found at Ife were made from raw materials in Sub-Saharan Sub West Africa. The glass shows no particular idiosyncrasies, which might alert one to the possibility of local manufacture. So she was very specific that based on what she saw, we cannot argue that there was primary glass production in Ife and also the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. So she went on to say that there is no sufficient reason to hypothesize the existence of a West African center of production from raw material for which no tangible evidence has been reported at least in a way, in fairness to her, maybe at that time there has been, I mean, there were very limited work done and then she came to this conclusion based on the available evidence at that time. But more importantly, which I would like to quickly point out before I start talking about my work in Ife, she specifically states, I mean, states that this is no site at which to investigate the Ileife glass industry. There, she was talking about a site in Ileife called Igbo Lokun, which has been uh, which has been described to have been a work a glass making workshop in you know Heli Ife period. So she was very specific, and that is you know what we know at that time, and the most of uh, interpretation about the glass and the glass bead technology production, the science of it was based on our work. 
And then, of course, I mean, nobody really, you know, bothered looking, you know, in details into this composition analysis based on uh, our work. So then what do we know about this glass technology in Ileife? For the past uh, almost a decade now, I've been working on the understanding the technology and production of uh, glass in any Ileife. Ileife is known uh, to have emerged as a complex society you know, around the 11th century, you know, up to about 15th century. And then there has been a lot of, I mean, there has been evidence of a lot of uh, 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 industrial kind of uh, activities going on if at that time. There is evidence of a uh, copper alloy working, there is evidence of a uh, glass uh, working, there is evidence of, uh, you know, uh, sophisticated, uh, well-decorated and well-made ceramic and also terracotta production was going on also. And they were also you know, engaged in the post pavement, which changed the, the, uh, the architectural sphere of Ileife at that time. So I've been working at this site in uh, Ileife to try to understand the glass uh, industry. And then over the years, uh, over about uh, three seasons of fieldwork, we have excavated an area about uh, 40 square meters within that small space that is left there. And then what we have seen so far is very, very impressive. Uh, our findings from the site so far is very, very impressive. The picture on the lower left of the screen is just uh, some of the glass feet you see on the surface at the site. So even if you walk on the streets of the site, you see uh, glass feet popping up everywhere, glass object pop popping up everywhere. So um, after one of our excavation, we clear everywhere. We also uncovered these uh, pit features, which we pretty much, you know, initially don't really know what it, it was or how uh, the features were connected with the glass production. But I think now I'm beginning to have uh, to believe that these were actually connected with uh, the production at the site. You know, considering how well they were made. You know, very uh, you know, well planned, well dug, and very smooth and well arranged. So there are quite a couple of. Uh, I believe there are other feet there which are yet to be uncovered. Like the one in the far north of the picture is. Uh, we couldn't dig into that. So we have, in in terms of materials, we have uncovered quite a number of uh, 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 materials, several thousands over 20,000 glass feet, about 1,500 1, crucible fragments, and they about five kilograms of uh, production waste, which is what you have on the right uh, side of the screen. So we have all these materials from this site. And the question is, what would they really tell us about production, you know, about this, you know, what would they help us to answer in terms of uh, invention, innovation, and the uh, technology and uh, science, uh, at this, uh, at science and technology at uh, Ileife. So first of all, we, we, we have analyzed quite a number of the glass beads, you know, uh, the glass you know, on the inside of the crucible. We analyze uh, some of the production waste. And then what we have so far is that we have basically three compositional groups the one with high lime, high alumina, the one with low lime, low alumina, high alumina, and then the one with low lime, medium or moderate alumina. So generally, these glass are uh, classified as light, I mean, high alumina glass with low sodium and the low uh, magnesium, which shows that they're completely different from glass that we know from other parts of the world. I will get to that very, very shortly. So in terms of understanding the production at the site as well, we've analyzed quite a number of the crucible uh, using SCM and the optical microscope. And uh, yeah, to look at the microstructure and the, the image you see on the top left of the screen is a uh, screen, I mean, image of the crucible under SEM. 
and then what you see on the inside are coarse grain, which we believe will have the, uh, you know, remnants from the raw material that were fed into the crucible from the coarse that were, you know, the, they were not melt, you know, the unmelted uh, coarse. That's what you see in the matrix of the glass. So the outer part to the right of the image is the glass and the, the, uh, the inner part to the left is the fabric of the, of the crucible. And then we also see a variation in the concentration of the soda in the fabric of the crucible close to the, uh, close to the glass on the inner, uh, inside of the crucible. We have a, a elevated soda, sodium concentration. And as we go further into the fabric of the crucible, we have you know, reduced sodium concentration, which shows that the high concentration underneath the glass will have leaked into the into the fabric from the raw material that was fed into the glass. So the idea is if this crucible was used in remelting of you know, uh, ready-made glass or imported glass, that amount of uh, sodium will not have leached you know, from the glass into the, uh, the, 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 the fabric. Uh, Professor Tilleren has you know, uh, encountered something similar you know, in terms of uh, understanding the behavior of uh, the chemical you know, component of uh, the glass and how it interacts in, with the composition of the, free, uh, the crucible fabric in uh, late Bronze Age Egypt. So we have a very good, we are very confident that that is exactly what we're seeing. And the more importantly, recently we've also been working on the lower left picture is a piece of a crucible with what is called semi-finished glass stick to the inside, the bottom of the crucible. Semi-finished glass is a very uh, significant uh, indicator of a primary glass production in archaeological sites. Because the idea is that uh, when you have, when you're melting glass and they, I mean, basically there are two, well, basically glass could be, uh, could be made in two ways. Maybe the first, the, the first way could be you know, having all the raw material together and met them in just one, you know, episode of uh, melting and everything just melts completely. And then the other one is, you know, the process whereby you melt them, not to the point where they completely vitrified, you know, and at the end of the day, you have something similar to, or something called semi-finished glass. And then the semi-finished glass is now taken to another perhaps maybe workshop or another space within the workshop to complete the process. So having semi-finished glass in this crucible does not really say whether the production was just one stage, you know, one complete episode or two stages. However, what it shows is that this was a kind of incomplete process of the production. So if they are not uh, melting the raw material in the crucible, they will not have left this, you know, uh, stage of uh, uh, semi-finished glass in the crucible. So we have analyzed that semi-finished glass, and uh, we have very strong uh, evidence to suggest that it was actually made uh, from raw material from around the uh, from around the region. So in terms of looking at the into in, uh, idiosyncrasies of ele effect glass and uh, what it tells us about creativity in uh, in the glass making, first of all, uh, it is evident that uh, ele effect high lamma aluminum glass is very unique and is very local. I mean, the raw material were sourced from within the locality, from within the environment, and uh, one of the indications to show that this glass is completely different from what we know from other parts of the world is um, this image that you see here on the right side of the, of the uh, screen. The first one, the upper one, compares the uh, concentration of rubidium and the potash you know, from Ilefe Ailama aluminum glass and with that of a late Bronze Age Egypt glass and the, uh, the Roman glass, you can see, I mean, it's, it's, it's self-evident. You can see if a glass concentrates, we have the cluster on the lower part of the, of the shard, why that of uh, uh, late Bronze Age and the Roman glass is you know, uh, everywhere else. 
So the same thing with the other one, comparing rubidium and estrontium. So you can see the stark difference between ileife glass and that of the and that of the uh, the late bronze stage and the Roman glass. So this shows that here we are dealing with you know very unique kind of a uh, glass glass in in Africa, which will have been made. I mean, which was made with a, a raw material local so within the uh, vicinity and then um so lactin i should say that lactin ige and the remain were the first to identify eye lime uh, to classify eye lime aluminum glass bead in ileife so they are of, of course the material that they work with uh, were from you know museum storage and lack archaeological context so what my work has done is to provide an archaeological context to their work and further understand how this lime, eye lime aluminum glass was made in the early life. So they are of the opinion that, um, so they conclude in their work that we interpret these findings to propose the primary manufacture of eye lime aluminum glass in sub-Saharan Africa in the early second millennium CE with production center in southern Nigeria and quite possibly in or near Ileife. And so far, so good. It's only in Ileife that we have high lime, high aluminum glass dated to between 11th and the 15th century. So recently, uh, Akin Ogudiro working in the Oshodbo, which is about uh, 40 kilometers north of Ileife, discovered some glass materials and the Oshudbo is what you see on this other map here. You can see that the glass from Oshudbo is also of the same composition with that of Ife, but Oshudbo is dated to 11th, I mean 17th and 18th century, which shows that the technology of high lama aluminum glass actually continued somewhere else after it stopped at uh, Ile Ife. And the one thing that is also, I mean, that stands out in uh, Ileife glass island aluminum glass is actually the ingredient they use in the coloration of the glass and also in the, the coloration, which is what I tag, uh, what I termed, you know, creative coloring. So yellow, for instance, uh, color yellow, for instance, is a common color among ancient glass. Opaque yellow was mostly used as applied decoration on the Roman glass and the late Bronze Age Egypt, uh, Egypt glass objects. Studies of ancient colored glass have revealed lead and thin antimony as the primary colorants for bright yellow, which were intentionally added to the glass batch. Glass beads and the other materials from the Roman period, medieval Europe and the first millennium AD Sub-Saharan Africa have shown concentration of lead and the tin oxide that suggests their use as colorants. However, this is not the case for the Ileife yellow glass. The concentration of lead and tin oxide are low at, insuffic at insufficient level to indicate they were used in coloring the glass. Then the question of how did they achieve the yellow color now comes in. So the only alternative colorant for yellow in this case would be iron, although often less discussed as a, as a colorant for yellow in ancient glass, it is highly tricky and technically demanding to use iron as colorant for yellow because if care is not taken, it will result in different colors due to the, uh, due to the region of absor absorption of ion in the glass and whether it was used in oxidizing or reduced condition. So adding colorant is not enough, but understanding the, uh, the, 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 the chemistry and the how you know, the furnace actually works. Because if care is not taken, you think you are adding a particular colorant to get a, a particular color, then it turns out to be something different. So in the case of uh, yellow glass in Ileife, we believe that perhaps they were actually using iron to achieve that yellow. It may not be that they were adding extra iron. Perhaps they were trying to, you know, they were controlling the furnace and the oxidation, you know, to, for the glass to turn yellow because 
in the yellow glass from Ife, the concentration of tin and uh, uh, I mean lead and tin and antimony is very low to so suggest that they were actually used as colorant. Then I will quickly turn on the uh, the colorant as well. So production of this actually is applicable to the colorless glass, you know, the glass, the clear glass. So production of colorless glass also attests to the creativeness and uh, creativeness of early Ilefe glassmaker. Glass, I mean, colorless glass was produced in two broad ways in ancient time. Number one, they had deliberately had the colorant in form of a manganese or antimony, you know, to decolor the glass so that you can achieve the, uh, the colorless uh, effect. However, antimony is a stronger decolorant event, uh, uh, agent, which when they had more uh, antimony, it's the color faster than uh, using uh, manganese. Both antimony, both manganese and antimony were used as colorant in ancient glass at workshop in the Middle East and the Mediterranean. The second way of producing clear glass relies on the skill of the maker in raw material selection and in the manipulation of melting condition and the additive. Pure raw material with very minimal or no impurities can produce colorless glass. Furthermore, the high or low uh, occurrence of uh, the colorant oxide in glass composition and the apparent colorlessness of glass have technical significance in ancient glass making. So implying careful selection of raw material, the uh, appropriate measure of the colorant and sound knowledge of furnace control are what is required for you to have colorless glass. In the colorless glass from Ilif, uh, however, the uh, concentration of uh, manganese and antimony again is so low that you know, they do not suggest that they were added deliberately to the color of the glass. So two things now that we're still really looking to. So were they deliberately looking, I mean, did they deliberately source for a very pure source of quartz with almost a zero impurity in making this colorless glass? Or were they having other agents of the coloration we still really don't know what was actually happening here, but either way, I think it's something that's really worth exploring and something that's really worth you know uh, uh, looking into. For example, if they were going after the uh, the pure raw material, you know, the pure uh, quartz source with low impurity, that means by looking at the raw material, they were able to identify that oh, this should be pure, and this should be you know. Uh, this should be pure and should be good for making colorless glass. So another, uh, quickly, another evidence that uh, suggests invention in Africa, te in technology in Africa is uh, in iron metallurgy. Uh, Dave Kilik uh, wrote this beautiful article in 2015 and lays out how uh, how Africans were really inventive in constructing this type of uh, furnace called a uh, natural draft uh, furnace. So because this type of furnace is unique to, to Sub-Saharan Africa and also it produces different, you know, it's very efficient in iron production and it's produced a very good result in this, in this melting uh, process. So, I mean, this is something really important and very significant and we don't really no more about, I mean, no much about it when we look at uh, Africans' uh, uh, contribution to uh, science, technology, and, and invention. Then uh, quickly mention, also look at uh, Iboku, objects from Iboku. Iboku is another good example of African uh, inventiveness in high temperature activities. For example, I mean, the source of uh, the Iboku copper alloy material has been Traced to somewhere within the vicinity, and also there is also evidence that uh, some of the copper alloy material also came from from outside, you know, from Tunisia, from the mine 
uh, in Tunisia, for example. But there is this uh, uh, combination of local raw material with external or imported raw material in making of these objects. And beyond that, the aesthetic and the intricacies of the production of this uh, So the uh, excuse me, please. So looking at the decoration and the production of the Ibuku objects, one will be um, uh, impressed about the level of detail in terms of the production, the decoration, the intricacies in applying all the you know all the motif on it, and it's really impressive. These are African made object material that deserve to be uh, looked into as being representing or showing African inventiveness. Then lastly, I will look at uh, a soup segmenta where uh, uh, Sam Nixon has been working for, for, for many years. He, during his excavation there, he excavated uh, the object, I mean, the image on the top right of the screen is actually a, a mode, you know, gold mode that they use in the uh, in smelting gold coins. You know, so so there is uh, also evidence that in the production of uh, you know purif uh, purification process of the gold at Esuk a Mecca, they were also they were using glass material to purify, you know, in that purification process which is a very unique kind of process of uh, purifying gold that is not known anywhere else. So this is a very impressive uh, technology in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa that really worth uh, mentioning. So as I begin to wrap up, discussion of, um, yeah, generally in understanding uh, technology in Africa that is initially focus on uh, stone tools, which everybody, most people agree that stone tools were, you know, uh, invented, so to speak, in Africa. But when it comes to sophisticated technology, why, why did the narrative change, you know, from inventive Africans that made all these stone tools and their form of varieties to non-inventive Africans who are incapable of making you know, sophisticated technology. So the question is, um, like I said, why the story change? Why did the stories change when it comes to more sophisticated technology involving high, tempr uh, high temperature activities? I will argue that perhaps because of the notion that invention and the innovation must be universal, must be universally embraced. You know, like uh, if it's only made in, you know, tiny part of Africa, and it, you know, it does not spread all over the world, then it doesn't work seeing it as a, a something, you know, as a really worthwhile invention. So this, uh, this uh, universal idea of understanding African past is obviously faulty, and they most of the time screw the narrative about African inventiveness. In terms of uh, glass production, Freestone 2006 has suggested that the Chinese barium lead glass may represent the second invention of glass in human antiquity. I will argue that perhaps there were more than two episodes of glass invention. Glass invention was regional rather than one time global event. The Ilefe I Lime aluminum glass represents another episode in the global invention, development, and history of glass. This series of inventions must have, must have been shaped by local and regional experience and experimentation. So now, so now is the time to start thinking, to start rethinking the way we write African history. The narrative must change. The discourse of the inventiveness of Africa must take a new dimension. With archaeology and the material invention, material intervention, 
we should be able to say to borrow uh, Ati Ogundiron and uh, Igis uh, Sam, our African ancestors were material scientists. And then um, lastly, I will leave you with uh, this quote from Mavunga, 2007, that the narrative of victim, uh, victimhood alone will not be enough. The generation of, uh, sorry, I don't know, okay. The generation, the generation of our children, the African millennials, we want to see signposts of creativity. We have seen stories of slavery, colonialism, apartheid, poverty, war, and disease associated with the black existence, where our laughter, joy, happiness, creativity, means making, and resilience in the African story. We have invested in showing how great others have been and forgotten how resilient, resourceful, and creative we have been in spite of it all. I think I will not, I cannot agree less with Mavunga that we have to change our narrative and our focus on Africa history from being a very pitiful continent to a continent that has something to offer when it comes to understanding uh, technology, uh, invention of uh, technological invention, innovation, and creativity. And then lastly, I would like to thank all the organizations and institutions that have been in support of my research in the last uh, 10 or thereabouts years. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Tunde. If you'd like to unshare your screen and then we will uh, move into a Q&A session. I've got a, a couple of questions um, you know, that have been sent in, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna start just by sort of congratulating you on such a really wide ranging presentation that um, just highlights how important archeological knowledge is for challenging um, many, many stereotypes about the African continent. And I think you've highlighted very clearly this issue of how deep-seated earlier perceptions of a lack of sort of, you know, both cultural stasis and a lack of technological advancement on the African continent shape the direction of early archeological research. And it's, it's studies such as your, yours that are really, um, highlighting how, how important it is it, for us to go back and look at the important though those early archeological investigations were, look at the premises on which those analyses were undertaken and perhaps revisit them, um, drawing on the opportunities that um, advances in archeological analysis um, is providing. So thank you very much for such a wonderful talk that kicks off this seminar. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Marcus uh, Martinson Torres to come in with the first uh, question, and then we'll go to Cyprian, and then we'll open up to, uh, to Marcus. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Tunde, and congratulations for a fantastic talk. Uh, I think I think this is obviously extraordinary material, important in terms of its uh, importance uh, for world archaeology and for the history of technology but it's also worth highlighting the, the nature and the quality of the work you have been doing with it, realizing its significance and then uh, finding ways to do uh, sophisticated analysis and digesting the data to do, you know, to bring things to, to where they are now. And I think this is quite uh, extraordinary and uh, standard really for future work. And of course I share um, um, the view that this is yet another convincing nail in the coffin of, uh, you know, Africa's uh, technological backwater where there's no creativity or invention or, or technological uh, developments. There are other examples that you were citing. Uh, but in addition, I think this is also important because it shows that for those of us who are interested in the, in the histories of technologies more generally, we can no longer just look at the Near East as the source of case studies or you know Europe in, in some cases and so I think this is also very important in terms of uh, and, and you were pointing towards this at the end of your talk as another set of case studies if you like that we need to look at if we are understanding or discussing more generally 
the context of inventions, uh, what triggers uh, creativity and invention in any context, uh, we now need to consider, of course, these, these African case studies. And, and this is something that I've pushed you on slightly um, before, but I wonder whether you could tell us a bit more in terms of your thoughts. Um, from a comparative, world comparative perspective, you look at the emergence of glass in a particular context in Sub-Saharan Africa, but we have at least uh, two other contexts of invention of glass. What is it that's triggering the invention of glass here that may be similar or different from what we see in early contexts of the use of glass in Mesopotamia, Egypt, or indeed in China? Is that something you've started um, thinking about. And a related question in first time and interest <clears throat> is, if this is the early context of an invention, how come it is so mature and so developed? Are you expecting to find earlier glass making in the same region that is uh, more rudimentary, less uh, advanced, less perfect, if you like? Yeah, thank you so much. Um for the comments and the question. I think they are very uh, important questions. I will uh, answer the number one, I mean, the number two question first, then go back to the first one. So which is um, looking at the, you know, the rudiments, you know, the, rudiment, the, rudiment, the rudimentary stage, the early stage of the production. In my work, I've always laid out the fact that what we see in 11th century in Ilefe is the ready state, you know, the, the finished state of the production. You know, we still don't know how the production, glass production evolved, you know, to get to that state because what we see at that time is something really well made, you know, something very, you know, beautiful. Everything was really perfect. And uh, I mean, that is, that has always been on my mind. And that question has been something that is really driving me in my uh, further uh, uh, research and the field work in the area to really be on the lookout for, you know, something that can really point to this very early stage of the uh, of glass technology. I mean, I should mention this quickly. Uh, one of the reasons why I think there are so many things we still don't know about the glass production is that the image of the crucible with a uh, semi-finished glass I showed in the talk is actually not from my excavation. It's from the material already stored in the uh, Natural History Museum of the Obafemi Awolowo University, which is the local university in Ileife. So all the materials that were collected dug in Ife in, in the 60s and 70s were dumped at the University Museum, you know, when it was still under the center of African studies. So during one of my trip, I, I was really curious to see what they have in their storage. And the, while I was going through the storage, huge boxes with a lot of different materials, then I found that. And the, we did not see anything like that from the excavation. But we are wondering, like, where are these stuff? So it's likely that, of course, I should also mention that Ilefe has witnessed a lot of, uh, you know, digging, you know, looting, illegal digging, and the uh, destruction due to construction process, building, and stuff. So, so many things are really gone. So I believe that uh, there are most, of course, there should be a very early stage of the glass production. And the, also the question that we also need to be, uh, something that we also need to be aware of is that in archeology, span most of the time, we don't really see those, you know, we only see something that is spectacular, you know, something that kind of jumps out at us. You know, the early stage of it may not be very pronounced like what we have now. Maybe it started at something like at a household level, you know, something very small within a small space, you know. So how do we, you know, find that tiny small space within this highly urbanized built over city, you know, compared to this huge site where we have everything finished and well-made, you know. So on one hand, definitely I'm uh, into looking at the evolution of the glass production and how it started the, I mean, no matter how tiny the clue we can get about the early stage of the production. However, if I, if we don't get anything anytime soon, I won't be surprised because of 
all these uh, stuff that I've, I, I've talked about. And uh, to number one, um, to the number one question, which is um, what is different from, you know, uh, the motivation for the production and the use of the glass. I think uh, what I see common, you know, globally, when you look at the history of glass is number one, uh, value, you know, the local value, I mean, value in a particular object or particular material. You know, for example, we see in the Roman world where they were making a lot of uh, vessels, you know, uh, houseware, uh, glass vessels and stuff like that. And uh, they were also making beads, of course, yes. And uh, the same thing in the uh, late Bronze Age Egypt where they are making this, you know, huge vase with uh, uh, glass and stuff like that. But in if uh, I think, like I said, value in a particular object drives what is really important and what they will make and they will use. So in if a glass bead in, in Yoruba land in general, glass bead is something very precious and very valuable. You know, so the question of why were they making just glass beads and not vessels, not glass vessels, to me, I think is answered by looking at the, 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 the value of those objects in the, in the society, in the culture. So what value would glass vessel have added to their belief? For example, I don't know, but I think to me, that uh, answers the question of why they were making glass beads and not vessel glasses, for example, because in Yoruba, uh, uh, in Yoruba uh, divine kinship system, glass beads is an indication of approval, you know, from the gods. And then you, as a king, you need to have beaded glass beads and the beaded, you know, other paraphernalia of your office must also be beaded, like your staff, your shoes and stuff like that. So glass has a very significant, you know, symbol and value within the society. So it makes sense to me why they will be making beads and not making vessels, you know. And then in terms of, uh, you know, what drives the, you know, the, what drives the invention in the first place, I think like, human beings everywhere, if we have access to certain things, there is this possibility, this impulse of experimenting with them and making something new. And we should also remember that glass is not the only power technology in Ife. You know, there is this bronze, uh, I mean, uh, copper alloy uh, materials, they were working copper alloy materials, they were uh, making uh, terracotta, well fired terracotta, beautiful terracotta, they were making pot sheds, well highly decorated, well fire pot sheds. So those will have actually sent precedent, perhaps, for before the glass technology actually came in. Of course, yeah, we still need archaeological evidence to really back that up and fight soon the argument along that line. I hope Thank that answers the question. Sorry. Thanks, Tunde. Um, just just to let you know that the the questions are piling up. So um, oh. so. Shorter answers maybe maybe good because a few people have to go. And I know Cyprian has to go fairly soon, but I think okay. his question relates directly to what you were saying. So Cyprian. It does. Tunde, thank you very much. It was very thought provoking, very inspiring. And you've answered about three quarters of my question already. One of the problems with this new Zoom format is you get signed up by the chair to ask a question and then get to see it get answered um, before you've had a chance to put it, but not entirely. Um, I was very interested in what you, your response in terms of value um, and the way in which glass fits into value systems in the producing society. And I wondered whether you would like to comment a little bit on the choices that are being made in terms of coloration. Um, because one of the things I think very evident in Near Eastern and Chinese early glass production is that glass tends to emerge very in a very intimate relationship with a series of other materials and often at times when their values are being manipulated or changing so a very obvious one is lapis for example and blue um, in Mesopotamia probably jade and green in some other areas and I wondered you were talking about both yellow and blue glass and I wondered if there's any evidence for how the color choices are resonating with indigenous value systems among Ife society and other materials and how this fits into a richer story um, of organic or inorganic materials that are being valued, manipulated, maybe changing in value 
at the time that Glass comes on the scene. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think at best, what I can say about that is a kind of, uh, I can only speculate, you know, because uh, in terms of uh, other uh, archaeological material that actually support that, there's no clear evidence to suggest that, you know, a particular material kind of uh, influence the, uh, the choice of uh, coloration. In the grass. However, in terms of uh, uh, the culture, the cosmology and belief, I think one can tie it to, you know, uh, the traditional belief, you know, in the gods and the deity, you know, each of these gods do have their color and their, their devotees also have, you know, the particular color that they should use or wear, you know, so that could be, you know, one angle to explain, it. for example, the uh, Obatala is associated with white. And uh, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, we are I'm currently doing a research for the British Museum on documenting, you know, uh, digital documentation of glass making, glass bead making in Ife. So when we were talking to interview Obatala priest, you know, he actually uh, ordered my uh, research assistant to pull off his chest because he was putting on a t-shirt, like uh, I think red kind of, and we're like, no, Obatala doesn't like red, Obatala is, Synonymous with white, so you cannot wear red. Why talking to me, or why you are within this Obatala shrine? So he had to pull off his shirt, and he was on his underwear singlet during the interview. And then you can see the priest himself is always on white. He has a lot of uh, white glass beads around, you know, all over his body. So the same thing goes to other gods too. You know, uh, Eshu, uh, you know, Shango, and other gods. They have their color representation. And that would be my, my best guess, like perhaps that is where, I mean, that could be one of the, you know, inspiration for these color differences. Sounds a pretty good guess to me. Thank you very much, Tunde. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tunde. I think other people have been asking rather similar questions about you know, having a sense of what the, the, the cultural factors might have been that had, had driven the, uh, the, the development of, of glass production at Ile. I've got another question here that relates to that is just based on your your data, what can you say say about the scale of production um, on uh, at, uh, yeah, at Ile Ife? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will be brief on this uh, because uh, in one of one of our articles, the one on the uh, glass cruci uh, glass making crucible in Ileife, published in the Journal of African Archaeology, we detail you know the scale of production in that paper. And uh, what our argument is that basically glass bead was the main object that were being fabricated out of the uh, the glass. You know this we should bear in mind that this are two different uh, production processes. The first stage of making glass from raw material and the second stage of uh, making glass beads out of the glass you know the raw glass so we believe that the glass beads was really made in mass it was huge mass production of glass beads why do we believe that which in the paper we try to estimate the volume of uh, each of these crucible in terms of the liquid volume of the glass that they will have contained and we convert that liquid volume into uh, weight in solid you know when it becomes solidified and then we weigh uh, a lot of the tiny glass beads and as you see that these beads are most of them are less than five millimeters which means that they are very tiny so we weigh them and try to estimate how many of those tiny glass beads can be made out of one full crucible and when I say one full crucible, we actually kind of try to be conservative enough because we believe they will not have filled the crucible up to the brim, you know. So like full crucible would mean like halfway. So we estimate that in the paper, like uh, with about 30 vessels we have in the assembly, so to speak, we're able to identify from the assembly. So if all were used once, so from that 36, they will have made over 6 million glass beads of those sizes if they were using ones. And if all were the big size, because we identify at least two sizes so far, the big one and the small one. So if all were the small ones, they will have made almost 200,000 glass beads using those crucible ones. 
and the way there is no indication that they were only used just once in the production. So it's possible that they use the crucible over and over and over again. So the production was really huge in terms of a glass bead making. Thank you. That's great. I hope I hope Walku that that uh, Tunde has answered your question there. Um, we have a couple of questions here that um, somebody's asking. In addition to beads, is there any evidence for making other kinds of glass jewelry from Ileife, or is it just beads? Um, and again, perhaps it, another related question is maybe you could just expand a little bit about what we know about sort of metal production um, and um, how that may or may not have related to glass production. I think I'm getting that right. But it, Linus, if you want to come in, please correct me. Yeah, um, I think uh, the first question has to do with, uh, so can you say the first one again? For uh, well, are there, are there other kinds of other kind glass of jewelry oh, yeah. or is it just? Yeah, um, I should say from, from the archaeological context and from the excavation that we have done so far and the most excavation that I'm familiar with in if a glass bead happens to be the only glass object that has been reported so far. However, there is a, a professor, late Professor Elu Yemi, who, is an, who was an archaeologist and also an indigenous of Ileife. And uh, on his death, he was also the director general for the National Commission for Museums and Monuments. So he was in a better position to do whatever he wants to do in terms of archaeology. So he documented uh, ethnographic evidence of a uh, uh, making of a uh, glass uh, bangles, you know, bracelet in Ife, but I, I, do, I can't remember reading anywhere where they found any other object apart from glass beads, apart from uh, uh, you know, reports on the ethnographic uh, uh, reports on the glass bangles. However, there is something called a uh, ajeleke, like a caked glass. You know, you have a kind of a combination of uh, glass. You know, mostly glass beads, uh, uh, production waste and stuff like that, you know, put together in a kind of mold and they try to melt it and then they kind of stop the melting midway. So what you see is a, a very flat bottom, you know, which shows where they were, you know, the mold where they put it and you see kind of, a, you know, the beads and the glass popping up on the surface, different colors. So, but uh, Willet mentioned you know, recovering something like that from somebody's farm, from one of those uh, places where they discover archaeological finds in the in the 60s and 70s. But we don't know the, con the archaeological context, and we also don't know the chronology for that. So my guess would be that that would have been much later, and uh, maybe that were made with glass objects that were picked up from these archaeological sites to make something new. You know, so. Um, yeah, that's all I can say in terms of uh, a glass, uh, other glass object. And then the quest, second one was more about the relationships between sort of um, high quality sort of metal production um, and uh, glass production. In, in terms of, do you see any sort of parallels between the sort of levels of technical skill that were required? Um, I'm elaborating yeah. a little bit on the on the, on the question here, but I think that's the gist. Yeah. So, on the understanding the meta working in Ife in terms of it, when I say meta working, I mean I uh, copper alloy working is still kind of very vague because what we see is this well-made finished uh, copper alloy object. We don't really see much of the production debris that suggests, you know, that will have given us an, a clue to how those meta objects were actually made. However, in uh, one of my papers coming out pretty soon, I argue that it seems that is a lot of, uh, there must have been some level of engagement and interaction between the glass maker and, you know, artisan working other materials, for example, the copper alloy worker, and perhaps uh, the iron smelter. So why did I say that? Because if you look at the colorant they use in, the, in, in glass, for example, uh, they use, uh, we have very convincing evidence that they were using 
copper material, you know, in getting the red color in the glass, for example. And then it is interesting that red glass beads are very few compared to blue and green. So they were not making so much red. And also we have this particular category of the glass bead that is, uh, if you look at the core, the section is colorless, clear, and in the, on the outside is coated red. You know, so most of the red are actually in that type, core, uh, colorless, and the red on the outer. So to me, I, I, I will argue that the question of a maximization of raw material comes in. So where do you want to use most of your copper alloy material? Do you want to use them in making red glass or you want to use them in making your copper alloy, beautiful copper alloy, perhaps very valuable you know, within the society? And of course, there will also have been some kind of uh, communication back and forth, interaction, cooperation. And uh, you know, that's also got me thinking about this notion of uh, uh, cross craft production, you know, how, uh, you know, uh, craft idea of particular craft, you know, cross into idea of another craft and how they were able to, to work together to make, you know, something uh, really beautiful at the end of the day. So there's no very good evidence on the, uh, the metal working, but I believe that there was a lot of interaction and cooperation among artisan of different uh, material. That's excellent, thank you. Um, so I've got a, a question come in from um, Ezekiel Mtetwa, who's joined us from uh, Uppsala, it's in the chat there. But Ezekiel, do you wanna um, unmute and pose your question? Nice to see you. Thank you so much, Prof, for the opportunity to um, ask directly, but also I want to say thank you to um, Baba Lola for such a thought-provoking uh, presentation. I like the materials you are working with there. Um, the question that I wrote uh, on the chat, which I will raise up here, concerns the period itself. You are working on materials coming from the changeover period from the first millennium to the second millennium. And what we see there is this uh, inventiveness that characterizes the period. And when I look at what is happening in Southern Africa, we, 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 we tend to see that period become as rich in inventiveness. For example, that's the period you see the development of dry stone walling in Southern Africa. And my research in iron production associated with Great Zimbabwe has so far dated two sites with natural draft uh, furnace technology, what you showed us from David Keely there. Um, we still need more dates, of course, but tentatively, it suggests that the same period witnesses the use of very advanced technology in iron production. So both um, iron metallurgy, architecture, but also even in ceramics, um, Chirikure has covered much work in some of those areas. We see this period as, or it begins to emerge that across the continent, uh, there is this continent-wide drive towards uh, or drive um, associated with inventiveness. And my question is, what would you say uh, from the perspective of West Africa and then Southern Africa, what would you say is driving this continent-wide inventiveness? Are we missing something in the first millennium which suddenly bursts in the in the crossover period. What do you think is happening there? Yeah, thank you so much for that you know, beautiful question. And I think uh, it's a very big question and very important one indeed in trying to understand you know, what was happening in Africa continent, you know, continent wide at that period. And I, we agree with you that of course, there was so many things going on within that period across Africa. 
And uh, one of the uh, uh, drive, you know, or, or driver for such movement has been, so to speak, you know, uh, 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 I think maybe contacts, you know, contacts with, you know, among the people of Africa, increase in contact and also contact with people from outside has been labeled as one of the drivers, you know, for such huge uh, technological drive and not only technological drive, also in the, you know, uh, social and the cultural uh, manifestation at that period. However, I want to uh, look more inward, you know, like uh, regionally, because, you know, when, for example, in terms of glass, when you look at uh, the invention of glass and this uh, notion of uh, the idea coming from outside, well, I'm not disputing that it's not possible that the idea came from somewhere, you know, like I said in my talk, you know, when we uh, try to look at uh, invention and innovation, and uh, we already have this notion of something imitated, you know, that obviously push the, uh, you know, the integrity of that process to the back, you know. So, and another thing that I would like to mention is that even though uh, we have the question of, you know, why that, uh, 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 why that production, that technology at that time is like not everybody. In fact, not Ife. Ife is not the first place to to actually have contact. I mean, to actually experience glass as it were. For example, in Africa, we have other places in Southern Africa. They were already uh, remelting glass at a, a Shimbu, Shimbu, Shimbu she, something. Can you help me with that? Shimbwene, yeah, you know, like a sixth century AD, seventh century AD, reworking imported glass, you know, in Mali, where I mentioned in the talk, you know, seventh to fifteenth century AD, they already had contact with glass beads from outside. Yet there is no evidence that they were making their own glass. Why not? So that means it's it's it's, it's more or less of individual kind of regional thing, and saying, oh, it was just one big drive that actually descended on the whole continent and then kind of, you know, changed the whole thing. So, I mean, in, why is Ife making glass and the uh, uh, Gao was not, for example, you know, and the Oiboku was not, for example, and the Nok, I mean, we know if there is any culture that should know how to make glass, everybody will argue it should be Nok. So why is Nok, Nok not making glass? So if it were to be one kind of general universal drive, so why is all these places that are will even considered to be more important and earlier in terms of contact and in terms of uh, exposure to other highly sophisticated material? Why didn't they adopt that you know, technology of glass making? So I believe or I want to say that it's more regional drive to me than continental drive. Of course, it may kind of uh, be uh, you know, why it coalesced within that period is a big question that we still need to look into. And uh, I think I deliberately leave out the technology of the stone, uh, dry stone technology uh, production and the construction in Great Zimbabwe because I think it's a little bit kind of out of uh, prior technology. Of course, I know, yeah, so that's why I actually left that because I know it's very important and it's something yeah, we should always look into and incorporate into such a uh, discussion of this uh, level. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zekia. So I think we have time for just one last um, sort of observation comment. And this uh, comes in from Stefania Merlo. I believe the, the real deal is Stefania Merlo rather than our friend Malibogo. Um, and, and Stefania is asking, um, should we in fact, abandon uh, the concept of invention anyway, because it carries with it so much baggage, if you like, and so much expectations of what we mean by invention. And that maybe uh, these terms may be you know, more of a hindrance than a, than a, a, a sort of asset in, term, in terms of uh, interpreting the archeological record of Africa. I hope I captured you correctly there, Stefania. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, 
that's really fascinating question. I think, um, yeah, I, I think, well, living the, uh, you know, the word invention outrightly, I don't think we really change anything. So what do we replace it with? Or, you know, or how do we describe that process? How do we describe you know, uh, that event, if we don't use the word invention or whatever, you know, they, we decided to use. For me, I think instead of dropping the word outrightly, what I will argue is that invention of any kind of object or material or technology is never a one-time thing all over the world. I mean, for example, of course, I think what we actually, uh, you know, what we uh, mix, uh, one of the ways that we mix up this whole kind of uh, terminology is that, for example, when we look at the discovery, you know, the stage of discovery of a particular technology, you know, is many a times used interchangeably with invention at the same time. So when we look at the state of discovery, the first appearance of a particular object, that one is always stand out, you can't contest that, you know, based on archaeological evidence. However, does that mean that's the end of it? There was never any, you know, improvement on, in, improvement on it, or people in different places did not adopt it and they, you know, reproduce it in a, in a different inventive way. You know, for example, I was talking with someone and uh, she, she, she mentioned to me, I can't remember who that person was, she mentioned to me that, uh, She's always fascinated, you know, fascinated about uh, bread. In, for example, how the technology of bread and production of bread really circulated all over the world, and uh, almost every part of the world you see people eating bread, but they are never made the same way, and they are not even the same kind of kind of bread that people eat, you know. But it's the same bread, you know. So, and I think another example that we draw from modern time is, for example, the time of uh, the very first computer. You know, so when Steve Jobs came in, came up with a, a, a Apple and everything, it was a welcome invention in the world of computer. And then nobody was saying that, oh, this is just, uh, uh, this is not an invention because it was actually invented so many times ago because, but he improved on that particular technology at that time. So I would argue that rather than dropping the word invention generally, we should look at it from you know, micro societal, uh, regional level than a kind of a universal global level. Maybe that will help us understand it better, what people were doing in the, uh, in the little corner of their region that is similar to and different from what they were doing elsewhere. I, I don't know if that really answers your question. That's all I can say. That's for it. In, in, in Stefania's defense, and because I'm not wearing my glasses, um, she actually said in, wrote innovation rather than invention, but never, nevertheless, you gave a very spirited response. So thank you, Tunde. Um, I, I think this is the point where we wrap things up. We say thank you very, very much indeed to Tunde for such a stimulating and thought-provoking talk. I'm sure there's lots more that we could um, you know, continue discussing. Um, and were it normal times, we would definitely be doing so, at least those who are of us who are physically present in Cambridge. Um, just also a chance for me to, to advertise our next talk, so on October the 22nd. Um, and it is another homegrown, fantastic uh, scholar, um, our Renfrew fellow, Beatrice uh, Marin Aguilera, who will take us across the Atlantic and she will be talking on slavery, emancipation, and the quest for reparations in Antigua and Barbuda. And we very much hope that you'll be able to join us next week as well. So to all of you, thank you very, very much for coming. And a special thanks to uh, Tunde for getting this Garrett seminar off, uh, series off to such a, a fantastic start. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Laurie, for Laurie for organising everything. And we look forward to hearing the uh, recording on on Zoom. So, with that, farewell, everybody, and have a nice evening wherever you are. Thank you. All.